introduce our next speaker who's going to tell us a little bit more about the reasoning behind this project and uh, and give us some of the why uh, as, as we search for our why. Um, uh, we'll all be excited to hear from Dr. Ajioma Nodim Opara. Dr. Opara? Yes, do you hear me okay? And do you see my screen? All right, perfect. <clears throat> and more importantly, do you see my face? No, I'm just kidding. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you for taking time to spend with us. I won't take much of your time today, but I am grateful to stand here before you on the original homeland of the Anishinaabe, the Three Fires people, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. And so we acknowledge with gratitude this land, the unceded territory of, ter of Detroit, of Wa'awiyatanong, and work with the um, existing uh, original uh, owners of this land uh, towards land back. I always also acknowledge my ancestors, my Black and African ancestors, that made it possible for me to stand before you a free Black woman, as well as a physician scientist. I am honored to stand before you as a co-investigator of Achieve Greater with the amazing, fabulous Dr. Sanjay, as well as Dr. Robert Brooks, Dr. Lamphier, Dr. Levy, and the whole, whole, whole team of folks, our community health workers, our community advisory board uh, folks, our community health equity council members, and the entire city of Detroit, okay, to make this work possible. Um, I am just really grateful. And I um, I'm an assistant professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at Wayne State University School of Medicine, and I lead a lot of work in health justice, health equity, and anti-racism in medicine, healthcare, and public health. So with that, let us proceed. And I love how um, our MC for today talked about the why. You know, um, as an African woman, as a Black woman, one of the beliefs and philosophies that ground us in terms of our Afrocentric worldview, always leading with purpose. Always leading with purpose. There needs to be a why behind how and we show up in the world. I do want to encourage someone to unmute, I mean, sorry, to mute, because there is some feedback happening. So maybe our moderator can mute all, or if you look on your screen and you realize you're unmuted, please just hit the mute button. Thank you so much. Right, so it's so important to think about the why. So uh, my beautiful and amazing co colleague, uh, Dr. Sanjay has outlined um, this great project and, to, and gave a, a great context, historical and socio-ecological context to the project that we are working on called Achieve Greater. Uh, but, but why at the end of the day? And for me, I like to keep it simple. The why is this. The why is the fact that in Michigan, of which we have a number of counties, but we're going to take um, five, Livingston, Oakland, Macomb, Washtenaw, and Wake, Wayne County. What you see here is this map, all right? You're got, you see this little sort of outlined area. This is the city of Detroit in the county of Wayne. You see all these green uh, colors here? What this means is that the average Michigan life expect expectancy is 77.7 .7 years. All right. So folks that live in the state of Michigan, on average, will live for 77.7 .7 years, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, but on average, 70, almost 78 years of life. However, in the city of Detroit, folks are living from minus five to minus 15, or rather five to 15 years less than 77.7 .7 years of age. In other words, on average, 62 or so years of life, simply by living in this region. And the question is, if folks are dying needlessly and preventably, what is going on? That is a symptom that something is wrong. Something is intrinsically wrong in the society that allows for this to happen for a minute and definitely for a day, a week, a month, a year, 100, 250 years. So this is our why. This is our why. The why that in the county of Wayne, in Wayne County, overall, the life expectancy again 
is on average 77.7 .7 as pointed earlier. However, right, white folks are living approximately a little bit over that, 70, 78, 79, almost close to 80. And black folks are living less than that in the 60s. So black Detroiters are put at high risk of dying prematurely, noting that this is preventable and this is a state of urgency is the why to unpack those reasons and create solutions to resolving them. And so when we unpack those reasons, we know now very clearly that the underlying driver is structural injustice, structural inequities, particularly structural racism. Dr. Sanjay has outlined one of those modalities of and uh, mechanisms of structural racism, which is the redlining. But there's so many other examples in terms of criminal justice experiences, in terms of education, in terms of healthcare, not just the access to healthcare delivery services or healthcare services, but also the experiences when we are in the healthcare setting itself, where folks are not listened to and not believed are dismissed, and the list goes on. Because we know that race is not biological, right? It's a sociopolitical construct. So racial health differences are usually explained by, again, social dynamics and the decisions we make as citizens of this society. And so through the mechanisms of the law, political processes, statutes, cases, budgetary decisions, allocation of resources, regulation and enforcement, there is a distribution, an unequal, inequitable distribution of resources within the social ecosystem, right, that we refer to as social determinants of health. So education, quality of education is apportioned on the inequitably, right? If you're a certain color, you get to live a certain place, and that certain place based on property tax taxes and values are going to determine the resources that a certain school gets in that district, which will determine the, the quality of educational experiences and resources, which then de determine income uh, potential, which then de determine the ability to own a home and build wealth with, uh, in, and pass it on generationally, and the list goes on. So public health and healthcare, neighborhood quality, education, economic stability, all of those are informed by laws, rules, regulations, et cetera, that are rooted in structural racism. And all of this ultimately speaks to the health differences that we observe, and in this case, specifically hypertension. This is another sort of visual representation of that, where systems, structural violence, that we usually call them, but systems of oppression, racism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, xenophobia, and they work intersectionally inform the, the access or the opportunities, right? Uh, to, that certain people in certain social categories uh, are able to, to avail themselves of, which then again speak to health outcomes. So again, housing, public safety, environmental exposure, health, food access, employment, and the list goes on. And it's so important to ground ourselves in this context and explain the why, because that needs to inform our strategy. That needs to inform our approach if we're gonna be about the business of actually resolving them rather than talking about them ad nauseum. And so what we see here in the city of Detroit in terms of age adjusted mortality is that how these realities, how these dynamics play out when you, when you look at health outcomes is that you see that folks are dying from heart disease, COVID-19, cancer. But these sit within this context. And that is really important. And so during the pandemic, uh, Wayne Health and Wayne State University and Wayne, Wayne Health specifically uh, got about the business of asking ourselves the question, grounding in the knowledge that, listen, uh, you, health occurs where people are at, right? Health is experienced in the community where people are living life. Health is experienced, illness is experienced there. If we are about the business of addressing health inequities, we gotta go to where the people are. 
we can't just stay in the throne room of the hospital and the clinic and expect folks to come, especially not in the in D town where folks struggle with transportation daily, ironically called the Amoto City. That's another conversation, right? And so we're able to leverage our mobile units to take vac testing and vaccinations to the community and use that as a way using our uh, geomapping spatial uh, technology, right, to identify hotspots called Phoenix, to identify hotspots in the city and then go ahead and get that care to the people, right, to so first of all provide the testing provide the vaccines, provide the education, but also receive the feedback as to what people are going through, how are they experiencing life, so that we can ensure that we are tailoring care to the realities of folks on the ground. And so in the last couple of years, we've been able to um, experience almost 75,000 patient visits including 52,000 unique patients delivering almost 50,000 COVID tests that also included screening blood pressure and providing sort of preventive service and linking to care. And what we recognize as the pandemic evolved and we evolved treatment and we evolved understanding of the disease and how to take care of folks is that we realized folks were saying, listen, yeah, we get it, it's a pandemic, but honey, the fact that we can't put food on the table, the fact that we cannot find a reliable job, the fact that my housing is unstable kind of is at the forefront of my mind. I want to do all these other things you're telling me, Doc, but I got to take care of my family, but I got to make sure these kids see tomorrow, right? These all speak to each other. And so we knew that we had to leverage this this, this, this methodology with the mobile health, health units to move from a pandemic response to a population health type delivery to really address the needs of the folks on the ground, meeting them where they were. <clears throat> and so these are two papers that came out of members of our team that really talk about how the Detroit uh, Wayne Health Mobile Health Unit was used to address Detroit population health uh, concerns, not just biomedical, but the social medical. And I like to say that social medical is the same thing. You know, R Rudolf Vachal, Vachal from 1948, you know, said that the physician is a natural attorney of the poor. I amended that to be the physician is a natural attorney of the disenfranchised or the marginalized. We are the ones that understand how all these intersect and speak and the realities and the social context of our people and communities speak to each other to inform the health outcomes. One doesn't do without the other. And so we started to utilize our mobile health units to start to address the issue of hypertension, right, as we noted that majority of the folks coming into the unit were, were met the category of elevated or stage one or stage two hypertension, over 60%, 63 to 67% had blood pressure greater than 130 over 80. And it was definitely an opportunity to actually bring that down because again, the city of Detroit le leads the county and the state in terms of hypertension, hypertension rates. And so you can see here in the city, in various areas of the city, all these areas in that are salmon, regardless of the shade of salmon, are folks with blood pressure greater than 130 over 80. The chances that if you walk into a, a store to get you some chips or get, you know, a gum and you say hi to that to someone, hey, how you doing, sir? That person has high blood pressure, very high, very, very high. And it's because of the reasons that was outlined earlier. So our chief grader, Dr. Sanjay, has done a beautiful job eloquently elucidating on our projects within the Achieve Grader, particularly project three. But essentially, the story behind this, not to go into um, bore you with the details, because you can always find the details um, online, we can always send you the information, is to say to ourselves, hmm, can we prevent folks from either developing hypertension or actually folks that have early or stage one hypertension from developing complications or progressing or worsening of their blood pressure? And can we do that? by beginning to identify, do two things. One, identify 
those social determinants of health that causes stress and increases what we call allostatic load, which is basically the measurement of the stress that folks have on their body that then results in poor health, like hypertension and heart disease and cardiovascular disease. Can we do that, right? Can we also deliver a program that is personalized, that is practical, that is customized, is adaptable and flexible, and is led and informed by the patient, is driven by the patient in order to impact their life and life circumstances by providing a menu of options to address those lifestyle behaviors that they want to change and equip them with the tools to increase their likelihood of changing it. Because again, patients are experts of their lives, their health, their context. We might be experts of health and blood pressure or hypertension, but they're experts of their lived experiences and both need to speak to each other in order to actually make um, uh, move the needle when it comes to health outcomes, including hypertension. So this is a, a visual of that, right? So that A, if we can screen for those social determinants of health, if can screen to see if folks are struggling with food. If they have, I have a, I read in the chat, somebody asked a wonderful question about um, hopefulness, you know, restoration of spirit, I believe it was Sister Marilyn, right? And also talked about, again, um, other, other important pieces there, spiritual, like I saw someone made a note about spiritual. We have a screening tool that speaks to all those. If we can identify not just housing and, um, and adverse childhood experiences of trauma and stress, Stress, exposure to racism and discrimination, uh, uh, employment status, uh, food status, and all those other pieces there, but to also ask about the assets of folks, their strengths, right? Do you uh, have a faith uh, practice, a spiritual pra practice, acknowledging the grief that a lot of people are currently under as a result of lost experience with COVID, right? And then connect folks that identify a social need to community-based resources, and then work with them in a way that is culturally humble, culturally congruent, and speaks to their lived experiences based on priorities that they set can we make a difference in blood pressure? And therefore, can we make a difference in life outcomes? Can we make a difference in that lifespan gap? And so we developed an approach called PAL2, which stands for pragmatic and personalized, adaptable and a pragmatic personalized, adaptable approach to lifestyle and life circumstances. And we've trained our, our community health workers um, using motivational interviewing and different uh, approaches and, and methodologies, including engaging with patients, focus, working with patients to focus them, evoking that, that change um, plan, and, and then the planning itself and planning out and follow up. All right, to again, impact those social determinants of health, which we know constitute 80% of health outcomes. And so this is Ms. Nakina Miller, our lead uh, community health worker who is outstanding. It's my pleasure to work with her. And so what our, our work here lives and dies on our community health workers who are outstanding. I call them community health leaders, frankly. And so they review our social determinants of health screener that all our participants fill out. They, they do a connection to community health uh, resources. They follow up with them. They make sure our patients and our participants are connected and stay connected. They indeed are healthcare team leaders um, as part of a, a, a team of clinicians, case managers, pharmacists, administrators. They are truly, um, they are, they're critical and core to this work. And one of the th key pieces here I wanted to lift up is that in, in Ohio, you all are very, very blessed whereby uh, your community health worker-led work is reimbursed. In Michigan, it is not yet. However, there was a recent change in the law. So it sounds like we are moving towards that direction, which is great. And hopefully the work that we do with Achieve Greater adds for the evidence, adds for the fuel to that fire to realize a full transformation of the healthcare model that centers our community health workers. So again, they go through all those social and, um, and economic uh, uh, drivers of, of health um, and work with our patients to address those. And even currently, we have been doing that and delivered a number of social services. As you can see here, food assistance, public benefits assistance, voter registration um, as well. I'll just mention this and then wrap up because of the time. And let me see here if I've gotten a warning. 
Uh, yes, I have a few more minutes to complete. And so essentially, when you talk about PAL2, I mentioned, uh, which is our, one of our main, if not our main uh, intervention, it constitutes really four components, which is to screen for those social determinants of needs and provide referrals provide feedback on the blood pressure, home blood pressure monitoring that our participants will be, will be participating in. Um, our community health workers also provide and review educational handouts with our, our um, participants, and they work with them to make a change plan where the goals and action steps that are to be accomplished are set out, reviewed, and the success is um, op optimized through the use of motivational interviewing. These are some examples of uh, educational handouts that have been curated for our participants. And ultimately, the goal, I love this picture, we love Detroit, we live Detroit, um, is that we produce a Detroit that is healthier, that lives longer, that is happier, and ultimately more prosperous. I want to thank our Achieve Greater team, uh, uh, all the folks you see here on this list, and so much more, much more. We will have like, I will need 12 or 15 slides just for their names. Um, also, but to particularly lift up our community health workers, our community advisory boards and community health equity councils and the entire Achieve Greater team. Thank you for uh, paying attention and uh, your time today. Uh, you can reach me through my email, which you see here, innodim at wayne.edu. You can also reach me on Twitter or Instagram, active on social media, because that's why the people are, go where the people are, at I at I N N O D I M.